Hi and welcome to the DP World Tours Life on Tour podcast. I'm your host Ewan Porter and today we're talking to a man who I'm sure is still on cloud nine after his victory in Qatar and he just happens to have a pretty awesome name as well. Ewan Ferguson, welcome to the podcast. Hey guys, how are you? You doing good? I'm doing well, yeah. Now look, uh, I've seen footage of you uh, arriving back home in Scotland at the airport with uh, reporters waiting there for you. And then just uh, before we jumped before we jumped on here, you told me you, uh, you're you being asked for selfies everywhere. Winning on the DP World Tour is a pretty big deal, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I, I knew it was before that, but um, I guess I'm still kind of like trying to pinch myself to realise what I've actually done. And um, so funny, my dad called me last night like, 8 p.m. I was out for dinner and he's like, "If you did, you actually win? If I just I've just woke up from a nap. Have I dreamt that?" And I'm like, "You know, I think I actually have, but it's just crazy. Like my how my schedule's going to change and everything. Um, so much like exciting stuff to to come with it. So I'm going to allow myself this week to be on cloud nine and be buzzing off it, and then I need to get myself back to work and remember that I need to still work hard at this game." <laughs> Well, you've got the uh, you've got the Rangers Celtic match this weekend too, don't you? I got invited um, to the directors box from the directors of the club. Um, uh, with, so I'm going with my brother to the directors box, and they asked me if I could if I wanted to go on the pitch and stuff at halftime, um, which is unbelievable. <laughs> it's just like incredible, but I don't know if I'm. I'm going to want to do it on that game to go down on the pitch because it's against Celtic, so it's a bit, a bit fierce. I don't want to get any abuse, you know. <laughs> oh, that might be a smart move. Look, I'm going to come back to Qatar a little bit later in our chat, but for now, I want to take it. I want to take a dive back to where it all began for you, which is where you are right now in Glasgow, a working class city, a football mad city. So, what was it like growing up there? Really great. Like my dad's a golfer as well. My dad's not a golfer, but he thinks to golfer. He plays like around the clubs and tries to have some fun with it. Um, I've always, I always thought he was amazing growing up. Used to go and watch him all the time, carry for him in club championships, county county championships, and he used to do quite well and all that stuff. He won some of them, so I used to be so into it with all with all that. Growing up, I had I was a mem I was I struggled to get a membership because I was wanting to play so much and I was like. Um, six years old, five years old, and the other clubs were like, "No, you need to be eight. You need to be eight years old." And I remember, it, I still remember it really well, actually. Um, my dad took me to his clubs. were saying, "No, it's too young. Sorry, too young. Sorry." And I went to one little club, Bears End Golf Club. It's only a nine hole club. Um, and it's right, right on my doorstep. Really, it's like I could walk there in five minutes. And uh, they said to me, "He's too young. Sorry." My dad said, "But he's he's good. He's really good. He's you know." And I'm like, "Right." The guy in the, the desk said, right, if you can hit the ball from here past that red stake, we'll let him in. And I hit it past and he went, right, he's, got, he's joining. So they let me in when I was a bit younger to join the club. And um, I've always kind of tried to pay them back with that and keep representing that club because I always remember that they let me in when I was, when I was so young, you know. Quite a cool story. Yeah, that's really cool. Do you, do you find that over time, over the last few years, a lot of clubs there in in Scotland and in the UK in general are becoming a little more open-minded and progressive with letting younger players and juniors play at their club? I think so, totally, yeah. Like, even now, I think people are going to want to play more just because clothing attire is a bit more chilled as well. Everything seems a bit more relaxed. Golf's kind of trendy and cool now. Like, yeah, so I, that's what I'm feeling like. I mean, I'm turning up to practice sometimes with like golf and hoodies on and like almost like like tailored joggers and it's just you know it's different and I think people are into it you know they're into the style of it as well like I wear all my Puma stuff and all my friends will be like oh that's amazing that stuff they're all they're all wanting to get it as well so I think beforehand people might not have wanted to because you need to dress so smart all the time and it's a bit more effort isn't it and now they can just go <clears> like that they can go out like that after so um, yeah, I think um, it's a lot more inclusive and just in general, people are a bit more open-minded. It's a bit less stuffy, I'd say. Well, you left school at 16 to pursue golf. At that point in your life, was was that the only feasible option at the time? Um, no, I actually went when I was 14 to America to go to high school. Um, so I went to high school out there for, yeah, until I was like 16, 17, kind of. But when I was 
16 I was actually trying in school and then when I was 17 I was playing tournaments so I was always traveling and stuff so I wasn't really there so there was no point in me really do, going to school anymore just because it felt like I was falling back all the time having to catch up because I was always away at tournaments um, mm. and then but you're not really it wasn't the only feasible option it was like maybe I want to go to college maybe this maybe that but I just felt like golf took over you know it just it was just non-stop like everyone was a full family were so involved in it everyone was you know I was a, I was a golf kid you know um, I was in the States I came back I was started to play really well amateur tournaments in Scotland and all around the world and then played Walker Cup started doing all good rounds here and playing against some of the best amateurs in the world and then yeah I guess I kind of turned pro when I was 20 and maybe took a little bit longer than I would have liked to fully charge on but still only 25 and I think that's still a, pretty young to be able to win you know yeah well we'll get to that point where you turn pro in a second but uh, in 2013 you won the British Boys Amateur Championship at Royal Birkdale and no, Royal, actually, Royal Liverpool Royal, Royal Liverpool sorry and 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 saying and saying a win is probably an understatement because you won that final 10 and 9 which is the biggest margin of victory in that championship since 1966 that same summer you won the Scottish Boys uh, stroke play championship and match play championship and you're still the only player to the day to hold all three titles simultaneously what was what was what was life like for you after that summer of golf because you really announced yourself on the uh, amateur golf scene then yeah that was like again i felt like a bit like a i felt like i'd almost felt like a bit of a superstar then to be honest i thought it was amazing you know i felt like oh this is i thought i was a golfer already almost uh, and then i was getting picked for all the scotland teams and gb night teams i was traveling to australia for four weeks going from there to south africa going from there to dubai i was like living a tour life as like a 17 18 year old amateur playing all the big events around the world i was going i was going to america playing u.s amateurs masters of amateurs in melbourne i was flying to sydney i was just like this is amazing you know I was in Joburg, Cape Town, just literally all over, all over Europe as well in the summer. And I was in all these teams getting all this for me and it was great. And I thought it was just like, I was, and I was with like three other friends, Scottish guys who were also in the teams or guys from Great Britain, Ireland. And we just had a great laugh. It was just like so much fun, you know. 2015, you, you mentioned the Walker Cup. You, you made the Walker Cup side, but you were a last minute addition to the team when Sam Horsfield pulled out. Was that unexpected or, or did you have an inkling that uh, that you'd be next in line no and I, I got I, put, I went to the I was playing really well that year I had like five top fives in a row and English amateur Irish amateur Scottish amateurs and I was like oh, I'm flying I was like doing so well and then I had a little stall towards before the Walker Cup was getting selected um, and I was like oh, I need to really kind of up my game here and get in this team Um. And then the US, Am US Amateur came around. It was in um, Chicago. And I was there playing with all the other guys. And I didn't have a great week, I remember. A couple of other guys did. But I was still playing really well. I think I was like 25th best amateur in the world. Which was still amazing at the time. And um, I got a phone call after, after the tournament just saying like, um, we've, we're going to pick you as first reserve just hang back because you know didn't really tell me what was going on then but uh well whatever basically sam wasn't sure if he was obviously wasn't really wanting to play or whatever or couldn't play i'm not sure what it was but um and i was like oh, okay and then all of a sudden i was getting messages from like paul like paul dunn and stuff and some of the other guys like in the team saying like you'll be good and all that don't worry and i was like oh, see what happens then the next week came the guy uh, nigel edwards phoned me and said you're in the team, like, you're you're ready for this. I was absolutely buzzing. Went there, I uh, played Royal Royal Lytham, and um, yeah, had a great week. Was flying. Um, I played in the first singles day against Maverick McNeely, who's obviously doing pretty well right now, and I I beat him on the last hole. Hold a nice putt on the last to beat him, which was really good. Kind of got the team going the right direction, and then um, on the second day I. I um, lost on the last hole to Bo Hostler. He had it really close on the last and I missed a putt for a half match and 
just great experiences again, just playing with these guys who are, I mean, Bryson DeChambeau was in that US team, you know, um, loads of like stars. Uh, so it's good that I'm kind of getting myself into that winner's circle now. Well, you only played the two singles matches that week. You were left out of the foursomes and and the four ball. Was that a disappointment to you, or did did you kind of the fact that you hadn't the fact that you hadn't spent much time with the squad and the team prior to it was it expected? No, uh, I I'd spent just as much time with them before it, but I didn't get in the four balls because it, the four ball they kind of kind of already made up. It was like there's so there's four four ball games with eight guys and there's ten man teams so two guys get left out of the four balls. I was the youngest in the both teams by quite a while. Um, I was 19 and everyone else was like 22, 23. Uh, and that, at that age, that's quite a big gap because these guys are all going to college together. They've all, mm. they're all like, so the four balls all worked out. Like everyone was like both from the same club. The other two guys are both at the same university and played doubles together. They're, so it was the way it worked out was like that, um, and I know then I I got told like, oh the next day you'll probably put the doubles, but then the first day we did so good in the doubles and we're like we're not going to change it up and like of course you just want to win mm. so you're like fair enough, and also I just feel like I'm a bit more of a, I'm just like a, I, I'm a bit of a singles player anyway. I just do really good like on my own, like kind of as an individual sport, isn't it? So I'm obviously more used to that. Well, Great Britain and Ireland, they thumped the USA 16.5 to 9.5 that week. So overall, I can imagine a, a pretty exciting week and a good way for you to essentially round out your amateur career. Yeah, well, yeah. I thought that was going to round out my amateur career, but I ended up staying at, uh, amateur for another year after that because I thought I'll just keep kind of trying to learn the process. Oh, I still felt a bit young. Um, but then after playing all the same events again for like the second, third year in a row, Felt like I had to move on to the next level in the end of twenty seventeen. So at the end of twenty sixteen, so start of twenty seventeen. So I, I did that. So when you turned pro, you spent, I, I'm guessing, twelve to fifteen months uh, before you uh, earned your card to the Challenge Tour via Q School. So what were you doing those twelve to fifteen months? Were you playing on invites? Were you playing satellite tours, Monday qualifiers? What were you doing? I started off playing some satellite tour stuff to prepare myself because I signed with a management company who were going to get me seven invites on the challenge tour, and which is the maximum you can get, and then like three or four invites on the, the DP World Tour, which is a really good deal for a guy just turning pro to like get these kind of starts. So I did that, and I got really, well, not lucky, but kind of lucky because... My first event, I finished like, um, it was in Turkey. I finished fourth, and that top ten got me into like the next week. So then I didn't need to use an invite. I started to do quite well off the back of that kind of stuff. Um, got some points up and managed to keep my card on Challenge Tour for the next year, mm. which was good. Kept my card on the Challenge Tour and played a full year on Challenge Tour, and and in twenty eighteen, and. Played really, really good and got to like the, the final event, which is the top 45 guys. And I remember I finished like 30 something in the rankings, and a couple of my friends got their cards that year uh, Bob McIntyre and Grant Forrest. And I, I remember in the last event, like being really happy for them, but just thinking, oh, like, hopefully one day I can, I can do that as well, you know. And then the next year, um, Connor Sign lost his card from the DP World Tour and back on the Challenge Tour so we were hanging about all the time and uh, mm. he finished top 15 get the card and he finished 14th I finished 21st or something just missed out he got his card again you know I'm all high five and cuddling him he's got his card I was like I'm so happy for him because we're such good friends I was just thinking mm. like, when will this ever be my turn you know like it's just so so I don't know what I'm missing I started thinking like, what I'm missing in my game like what did I not do this it's good what am I missing like what's not there's obviously something that's not quite getting me over the line to get my my card because I was so close for a couple of years there and then COVID happened but because I just missed out on my card um, that year that Connor got his in 2019 2020 COVID happened and because I just missed out my card I had like a uh, like a half category almost like I still had some status on tour Mm. And because of COVID, no one really wanted to travel. Like, a lot of guys were just staying with their family because they froze the categories and stuff. 
so I got in like all the events on main tour. Um, so I played like 20, 22 events that year on the DP World Tour, which was good. Quite a lot of events, got a lot of good experience from it. Um, met a lot of people that I felt were really valuable people to meet. And then yeah. the next year I was still getting some main tour events. I thought, should I, I had to make the decision before the year started in 2021. Well, I play some of the main tour events because obviously you're playing for a wee bit more money. We're playing for well, quite a lot more money. Um, and maybe try and have a good result and get my card just through the few events that I get in on the main tour. Or will I go back to Challenge Tour, play in almost every event, focus, get it all right, and get my card, and then I've got a full card and I can play what I want. Which is a bit of a risk to take because obviously you want to play for more money, you want to play with the top guys, but I thought I'll take a kind of step back almost to go forward. And went yeah. back on Challenge Tour, just grinded out every every week. Played so many tournaments in a row, just grinded it, grinded it, grinded it. Finished second three times, third, fourth, fifth, was just battering out the top fives. Lost in a playoff, just couldn't quite go over the line, but wasn't that fussed to be honest. It's all about just getting your card, just get my card and I'll, and I'll look after everything after that. So got my card, finished eighth in the rankings and then that was brilliant. And then started this year um, on the tour, so I've only played six events this year. Well, it must have, it must have been a huge sense of relief uh, and probably... I guess for you too, at the end of 2021, given the fact that you'd sort of bounced back and forth for three or four years as a professional, you probably felt like now's my time to shine. You've seen your, your friends in Bob McIntyre and Connor Syme excel out there. So I'm sure you probably felt that 2022 was your year in some capacity. Yeah, I did. I felt like, um, I felt like it was, I felt like I didn't get my card these years. I just missed out. I wasn't sure at the time, but now I feel like it was just because I wasn't ready. Like, I just wasn't fully mature in my own development as my gate in my game and just mentally. But I've got my own, I've got like a really good team now with my coach, my psychologist, everything's in place. I had it all last year. Dealt with everything I've had to deal with. I got my card and I, when I got my card this year, I just felt like, like it's the right time. Like, I'm a, I'm a good age. I'm still young. I'm still, I'm strong. I feel like I'm ready to really push to the, to this level. Um, and I, I said that in other interviews as well. When I got it, I felt like it's the right time for me. I felt like maybe if I did get it in twenty nineteen, when I just missed out, I might have lost it the next year, just because I wasn't totally ready. So I think that's why I got it when I did because I was actually. My game was ready. I was mentally there to be able to compete yeah. at the highest level. Well, tell me about your, your overall experience on the Challenge Tour because a lot of older players, a lot of veterans, that some of them can begrudge the fact that they get relegated, whereas a lot of younger players, they I guess they kind of look at it starry-eyed and as an opportunity to elevate themselves to where they want to be on, on the main tour. So for yourself, having spent essentially three seasons out there, uh, what's your take on the Challenge Tour? To be honest with you, I absolutely love it. A lot of guys, some, some you're right. Some, a lot, a lot of guys come back from the main tour to there that have lost their card, and it must be tough for that though as well. Playing for that much less money with families and everything. Um, you're not playing in major cities. You're not getting courtesy cars. You're having to hire your own car and stuff. But the tournaments themselves are really, really well run. Um, we play on good courses, good fields. It's, it's really really well run tournaments it's really a really good tour and I think it's it's been plays such a key part in me obviously being a winner now um I, I actually really enjoyed that so many friends out there it's a, it's a much smaller like circle out there everyone's like well not everyone but like like me and all the other although well, even some of the Europeans but all the Brits as, as well we're all just like mates. We're all playing practice rounds together. We're all going to laugh together. We're all going out for dinner together. Um, and on main tour, it's a bit more, everyone's got their team. Everyone's got their full squad with them, you know, like psychologists and coach, swing coaches, putting coaches, and they all kind of stick to themselves. So main, mm. so your chance tour is fun like that. Like you do have a lot of good times and a lot of fun. And yeah, I, I actually, I, I was never moaning out there. I never moaned once. I just really enjoyed the journey of it all. I, Plus I, plus, I actually do like love golf. I really enjoy playing. I really enjoy practicing. I really enjoy 
the atmosphere that comes with the game, the smells, the you know that fresh cut grass, the morning dew and the greens, like all that stuff, just gives you gives me a good feeling, and um, I just embraced it all and tried to keep my head down and get on with it and block out some of the people that might have been moaning about the food and you know having to hire a car and drive two hours to the tournament, all that stuff. I just thought it seems like a nice wee adventure, you know. So I feel quite as if I'm quite chilled that way. Oh, look, one of the terrific initiatives from the tour's new title partner, DP World, is that this year, in, in 2022, they're helping uh, the Challenge Tour graduates cover their, ex, uh, cover their expenses for the year. Um, and with yourself being one of those graduates, uh, how beneficial has that been in the early part of the season? Um, yeah, really good. Obviously, got a, cup, a, a nice bonus from the Challenge Tour graduate for winning. Um which is fantastic. Um, helps so much, but at the end of the day, like, I always feel like if I just take care of myself and play really good golf, like all these things just take care of themselves. Like it all look after itself. Mm. But in the end, obviously, when you get that kind of help and that new setup and foundation that's been started, it gives you a little bit of a intense air and initiative to want to do well because then things will get start getting paid for you almost so i guess it is in the back of your head and it, it gives i think it's a, a really good way to do it because it gives players a bit more fight to get to that position to they know they'll be set up a little bit better because it's it is quite yeah. hard at the start you know obviously um it's a lot of travel and there's a lot of out, a lot of outgoings and money you know you mentioned when you turn pro, you're a little bit more on your own. This is actually something that I've spoken about quite a bit with Golf Australia here. It's an interesting topic in that you, you had mentioned that after you won the British Boys Amateur Championship, you were flying literally all over the world playing tournaments. And, and really, that's all that, you know. That's all paid for. Everyone looks after that for you. But when you thrust amongst the wolves, uh, when you turn professional and you're on your own like you were for... 12, 15 months before you reach the Challenge Tour and then Challenge Tour is, again, a different kettle of fish altogether in unfamiliar places. That transition can be quite difficult. Is is there anything that, uh, I guess I'm putting you on the spot here, is there anything that you would do differently to the top am- well, with the top amateurs coming through, perhaps uh, having them not rely so much on the golf bodies and doing things perhaps for themselves a little bit more? Yeah, that is one of the tough parts about it. Like, I think that's sometimes one of the hard parts about going. I think that's why sometimes people might stall a little bit from going to amateur to pro, just because all of a sudden you're having quite a lot of fun with mates and people, and all of a sudden you're just catching a flight yourself, and a car yourself, and a hotel room yourself. I don't really know if I have thought about it how to change that and how to make it better. We did have help. We had we did this. Sorry, the Scottish Golf were great. They they did get us help us out with some sponsors and all that stuff so that when we turned pro, we had some money behind us to be able to do it all. But it's such an individual sport that I might be playing that tournament and your mate that you were just playing all amateur stuff has got an invite to a Corn Ferry Tour event when he's turned pro in the States and all of a sudden you're just separated, you know? You're doing your own thing and you're trying and... That's part of it. You need to go and make some friends now, you know? You need to go and... I don't know the kind of way to bridge that gap. It's quite... It is difficult, but it's also the time where you can maybe try and find yourself and strengthen everything. And some people just end up not enjoying it and just stopping almost, yeah. All right, let's go back to that epic week in Qatar. Uh at the start of the week, you'd come off a, a pretty impressive stretch of golf prior and you held a 54-hole lead in Kenya as well. Did you get the sense at the start of the week that you are on the verge of something special? Was it was the game trending towards that victory? Yeah, I never really start the season that well, to be honest. But um, I played quite nice in Abu Dhabi. Got some points on the board early, which was my goal for the week. Um Got got COVID, so couldn't play in Dubai and stuff, and didn't really do much for the next couple of weeks. Sat about, played terrible when I came back from COVID, and and wrestle came out, and I was like, oh, and then um, so I only played two events, and I was like, played well in one, got COVID, and was kind of rubbish for the other, and then uh, went practiced a bit with my coach, done a lot of work, went to Dubai before Kenya, went to Kenya, 
Obviously, he was leading by four going into the last round and kind of messed up a little bit. Went to Africa, which is a bit... South Africa, which is a bit different kind of courses to play, really tough courses to play. Had two kind of... Made the cuts in both. Wasn't amazing results, but they were decent. I felt like my game was good. And I went into Qatar and me and my coach were just saying, like, let's just try and get yourself into contention, you know? And if you win, then so be it. And if you don't win, like, at least you're just learning so much valuable experiences where you know and also that's what you practice for to try and get yourself in that position you know it would feel great and you can just keep trying to better yourself and I was like yeah I just felt like the course suited me like it's really mm. tight it was windy you had to hit greens you had to shape it and I'm quite good at all that stuff so I thought right let's just kind of keep the head there and go for it and you know I just grinded away all until the, the way until the end and you know, some finish well, that Kenya experience where you held a four-shot lead going into the final round, wound up shooting 76 to finish in a tie for eighth. What did you learn from that and, and how did you put that into practice uh, to make amends there in Qatar? I don't think it was about um, putting anything to, to practice because you just can't practice the feeling like that or when you're out there. You know, it's hard to practice with as much intensity as I was putting on myself into the final round. I got a f- I was leading by four shots after three days, and I was kind of just thinking like, imagine I was a winner like when I was going to bed and stuff. I just couldn't quite get my head around that, you know, I'm going to go out here and almost and try and win. And I was struggling to focus on my shots, and I was hitting it really hard. So I wasn't like playing the game I was normally playing for the first three days. Um, kind of lost a bit of feel and all that stuff which, which happens in this game it's a really really difficult game as I'm sure a lot of the listeners will, will understand playing their local medal or whatever you know just that bit of overthink is is a tough thing but the thing I took, a, took from it after Kenya was the fact that I was leading by four shots mm. after three rounds and you know against some of the best players in the world like that's pretty impressive in its own right I'd say like I was leading by four shots after three rounds like that's amazing I'm, ob- I'm, I was, yeah. I'm, ob- I'm obviously a very accomplished golfer to be able to do that um, and that's what I took from it to be honest like I, I literally went to the next couple of weeks thinking I was leading after four rounds I was after three rounds by four shots like I can I can play against these guys I can really do it um, and just kept going and I think on the last day in Qatar I was just like I remember kind of almost getting so far ahead of myself I was in Kenya, thinking, oh, it's done, it's done. Even though I'm still tied to the lead, I'm still only one shot behind. Just because I was leading by four, your head's just like, oh. But this in Qatar, I was like, all you need to do is just keep yourself in it. There or thereabouts. You know, one bogey, one birdie, two shot swing like that. So that was my key thoughts. I just keep myself there or thereabouts. Don't blow yourself out of it. Just keep yourself in it all the way until the end. And then... We'll see what happens. And sure enough, chip in on 16 for Eagle and I just felt it. I just felt something. I was just like, this is this is my, my time to to really knuckle down and, and do it. And then I had that putt on the last, obviously. I'm sure a lot of people watched it and I just said, I was lining up and I just said to myself, I'm not leaving this short. Like I'd left some short on chance to and maybe lost in a playoff or, you know, I'd, I'd finished second and I was just like, this is, this is, I'm, I'm making this make sure I, I get it to the hole, give it a chance. And couldn't have put a better stroke on it. came right out of the middle of the putter and I looked up, I just thought, that's tracking. And sure enough, it was straight in the middle. Well, you said in your post-round interview as well that you'd, you'd been spending a lot of time with your coach, um, Jamie Goff, on all facets of your game for quite a long time. But he told you on that Sunday to arrive a little bit early to work on your chipping because it hadn't been up to scratch. That chipping you mentioned on, six, on 16 for an eagle... Is there a direct correlation between the two? Oh, 100%. That's why we're laughing about it at the end as well because I was chipping in the third round. I didn't really, it was got really windy in the third round, so you not as easy to hit as many greens. So you had to do a little bit more chipping and putting to keep your round together. And I missed a couple of greens. It was simple little chip shots, but the grass was really tangly. And there was a lot of wind, and I was chipping it. I felt as if they were nice chips, but they just weren't going that close. It's, something was quite missing so I, I, Goffy's seen that on the stats as well and said right let's meet up tomorrow early 
get there an hour and a half before and we'll go to the chip and green even before we start our warm-up and i was like all right sounds good so got up in the morning went to the chip and green and i'm chipping he says you get too much too quick in your backswing you're opening the face too much so it's not you're hitting it striking it a little bit out of the toe you're not getting the you're not using the grooves as well so I, I squared the face up and just tried to like slow my backswing down and gripped at the top of the shaft a little bit and let the momentum kind of take over and um, so i had a couple of chips before that had a couple of nice pitches and i was like, oh it's quite good that like and then i got on to 16 and it was just the perfect kind of chip that we were practicing and i said to my caddy i says i fancy this one by the way and he was like right we'll just focus and if you make it, you make it, we don't force it in. And I was like, no, 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 you're right. And I just squared the face up, instead of opening the face up and letting it, I don't know, maybe coming out a bit softer and the wind getting it or whatever, I just squared the face and struck it perfectly, but I could feel the strike so good it was into wind that I knew it had the, the grab on the ball that I was gonna get a little bit of spin and it was, it was within my own control. And I just watched it release out to the hole and it was just straight in the middle. You mentioned the putt that you had on 18. Yes, we have seen it, that 15, 20-foot birdie putt. Standing over that putt, you were tied for the lead with Adrian Moronk at six under par. He still had a few holes to play. When you hold that putt uh, t- to go into the lead at, at seven under par, you obviously still had to wait a little while before he finished. What what were you doing and, and how were the nerves at that point? At that point, I was so excited. I was so, like buzzing with how well I'd dealt with everything that I was watching it in the in the room and I just felt although like I hope this doesn't go in a playoff because I just can't see myself but I couldn't see myself like regrouping because I was so like ecstatic with how everything had went and I felt like I'd done enough to win almost but golf is so hard and everyone out there is such an amazing golfer and I felt although Adrian could easily make birdies, make eagles or whatever, but I knew it was really, really windy. So mm. I was in that room and I was just not wishing bad on anyone, but just hoping they do well, but just fall a little bit short of me and that's what happened. <laughs> Did you have any friends waiting around to uh, celebrate with you that evening? Uh, my caddy and my my coach were they both there and I had a couple of friends, but there was just, when on on to it's just so much going on like even for me like I was getting picked up at 4 30 the next morning to go and catch my flight and all that stuff and I just knew that I would be so busy with things that I'm not a big drinker anyway it's gonna, everyone's gonna think I'm boring now but I just kind of <laughs> chilled and I was knackered and I just wanted to speak to the people and I was so everyone at home you know all I could think about was everyone all my family at home and how how they are so how happy they would be and I just knew how proud my mum and dad would be and that was just made me feel so so gave me a nice buzz inside um and then got home and I've been really busy doing this kind of stuff uh speaking to like the Scottish people and journalists and kind of going on tv and doing like news stuff which has been so different for me but all part of being successful I guess isn't it yeah, well, you're going to have to get used to it. Now, going back to the the Scottish boys, uh, you mentioned your relationship, your friendship with Bob McIntyre and Connor Syme, but you're also good friends with Callum Hill and uh, and Grant Forrest. What's the rapport like uh, between you all? And then uh, you did make mention before of when you're out on tour that you tend to hang out quite a bit. Do you play practice rounds together? Is it a real sort of club unity between the lot of you when you're out on tour? Yeah, absolutely. I was out with... Callum every night for dinner in Qatar. He got in. He's in. He's injured right now, which is a shame. But he tried his best to play, and his injury just wasn't quite there. Still, so we still had dinner every night. And on Saturday night, we're eating dinner, and he was like, "Dinner's on you tonight." And I'm like, "How's dinner on me?" Like he's like, "You're winning tomorrow." He's. I'm like, "What is seventh place? Like I'm not gonna win. Like I'll, you know, I'll try my best, but I'll take a top five. You know, we're laughing and stuff, stuff like that." And he and um. I don't know, like I had dinner with him and Jackson Brar, English boy my age as well. And he and he was saying he's a really good player in his own right, and they were both like just telling me that I was gonna win and stuff, and I'm like, they're mental. But I guess when people tell you you're gonna win that much, and everyone around me kind of was that like, you're gonna get over the line, you're gonna get over the line, you start believing it yourself. And I think that's what made me a bit more comfortable coming into the um coming into the end, like I've been told it that much. But then I guess it goes to show how good the friends and how nice they are to support me like that at the same time 
with Connors all the time. Most times, um, we have a great, a great laugh. We play money matches on, say money matches for twenty quid, on a Wednesday, a practice round just to focus. But it's not about that twenty. Even though that twenty pound gets handed over at the end straight away, depending on who wins, it's about that about the bragging rights. You know, we're in <laughs> after it. It's like, you know, we're fist pumping. We're proper going for it when we're playing against each other. So. Um, yeah, we play little games just to focus a little bit, which is good fun. And then, obviously, Bob, really good friend. We're all really good friends with Bob, who's some laugh and an amazing golfer. We've been playing together since we were, like, 12 years old. Great to see how well he's doing. Um, he's kind of separated himself a little bit with playing in some of the the majors and WGCs, and he's out in the, in the States and stuff, so we've not been hanging about him as much lately, but I'm sure... Um, We'll start hanging about them when Europe comes around again a little bit. Three of those names you mentioned, uh, Bob, Jack Singbra and Connor Syme, I got to see them play for the first time. I think it was the 2017 Walker Cup at LA Country Club. All obviously terrific players, but great young lads as well. Yourself, Bob, Callum, Grant Forrest, all winners on the DP World Tour now. All good friends growing up in Scotland. Have you been pushing each other? Uh, these last few years will really right from junior golf to succeed yeah absolutely I think we've all been doing we've all been winning since we were young and I think that is we're all it breeds winning again doesn't it like when you see these people who are winning and you're your mates and you're playing them all the time they're winning you want to win and all of a sudden you start thinking about winning which is what we're all doing as amateurs and was it all of us were doing it as amateurs, we were winning all the time, we were doing brilliant, we were playing great, we were playing tour starts as amateurs, you know, we were doing really well. And then you turn pro and things change a little bit because you're a bit more on your own. But mm. I think we've all started to find our feet a bit again and start it's starting to get that way again. We're a bit more comfortable like we were when we were, when we were amateurs. We're comfortable yeah. in our surroundings, we're comfortable with dealing with a bit more cameras around us and interviews and people and um, I'm hoping that we can start breeding that again that we did as amateurs which is looking that way looking like it and uh, just keep kind of bringing some some more trophies back to back to Scotland. Well it's a huge year in 2022 for the Scottish Open a new title sponsor in Genesis co-sanctioned with the PGA Tour, you must be chomping at the bit to, to play that week. Oh yeah, I can't wait. I was thinking about it for ages. I'm like, I might not get in that because it's co sanctioned with the PGA Tour. My category might not. And then I'm like, oh, maybe I could ask for an invite. You know, I'm Scottish. And then I'm like, oh, I could... And then all of a sudden, I don't even need to worry about that now. I'm on the top of the, the team sheet to get in almost. So I'm like, I know I'm playing. It's brilliant. I can plan my schedule a little bit better. And um, it's in Scotland, there's going to be loads of people who back support me. I'll probably get in like a featured group with some of the kind of top players in the world, just being from Scotland and being a, a winner in, out here. Um, it's going to be un- amazing. And I, again, I'm just going to take it as another opportunity to learn against some of the, the best players in the world. But I can also try and beat them and see what I can do against them, you know. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, absolutely, it will. And uh, look, a, a lot of players uh, when they when they win, they've got you know they've got their job secure, I guess, for the next two to three years. Some continue to roll on with it and they free wheel free wheel it and uh, go from strength to strength. Others tend to look at perhaps look at their weaknesses, try and work on those, uh, knowing that they've got the next two three years really to figure it out. How do you plan on forging ahead from here? Mm, not doing anything different. Just keeping all my same equipment, keeping all my same coaches, just doing everything exactly the same. Just enjoying it right now. Been enjoying it for the last year and a bit, last two years, really feeling comfortable in my own surroundings and in my own body and when I'm out there. And I'm just trying to just gonna do everything exactly the same. Just having a great time with it all. And um practicing and everything all that stuff being brilliant. And then don't get me wrong, some days you do things that just aren't great and I'll still have bad days and bad weeks, which is part of this game. But that's why it makes winning and feels so, so special when you get over the line because you don't win much in this game. Well, that win opens a lot of doors for you on the uh, on the DP World Tour and globally now as well. Uh, looking ahead 5, 10, 20 years into the future, what does it hold for you and Ferguson? Where do you see yourself? 
oh, well, I wouldn't like to put a lot too much pressure on myself, but I just like for the for the close future, I'd like to or the near future, I'd like to see myself playing on some of the majors in WGCs, like like Bob's doing. I'd love to get kind of elevate myself into that level of playing against the top kind of sixty four guys in the world and um playing in WGCs and the majors and getting into the opens and stuff like that would just be with where I'll really see myself in the next couple of years. And then in the long term, you know, I'm not too sure. I can't control that, but I'll just keep trying to control all the little things that I can deal with in my own game to get better. And hopefully that sees me being a, a multiple champion. Um, But uh, no matter what, you can never take this one away from me. And that's just probably one of the best feelings. You've got a lot of friends out there uh, who you've referenced around your age. Do you have um do you have anyone sort of who's been out there a long time, 15, 20 years who's been really successful, someone that acts as somewhat of a mentor to you to be able to guide you now that you're uh, on that path? Um well, I think I found, ended up finding that in my coach, Goffey. I know that sounds but but he's been around for so long. He's had 24 wins on the tour now with the players. There's a lot and um he kind of got me that, like, I feel like when I'm out there, it's like a bit of a father figure on the tour to help me deal with things and practice schedules and know what I'm up to. And he also coaches some good players. Of some of the guys have been brilliant with me, like David Drysdale, been there for years, really, really nice guy. Um, Scott Jameson has been messaging and been really nice. Um, Another guy that was really nice to me in Challenge Tour, like, who's still really young but really good, that I met uh, Matteo Manasero, really nice guy. He's been brilliant. Um, another guy who's really, really made me feel comfortable a couple of times on tour that I'll remember is like Gregory Havry. Um, mm-hmm. lovely, lovely guy, An absolute big dude of a guy, and he's won Scottish Open at Loch Lomans and stuff like that. And you know he's a really nice, really nice guy. And there's there is there's there's a lot a lot of really nice people out there on the tour but it's again it's an individual sport in the end of the day so you still having to do your own thing but um yeah i get i think if i asked a bit more i asked for it, the a lot a lot of people would really help me but just because i've got my own wee clique of young scottish mates and we all just run around the chipping and putting green together <laughs> and i've got my coach i just feel like i've got a nice solid foundation of I feel like it's going to be a good team and a good set up to go on and do well. Well, it does. It seems like you're doing all the right things. And Ewan Ferguson, thanks for joining us today on the Life on Tour podcast. Enjoy the continued celebrations over these next few days before you get back to work. And I'm sure that Qatar victory is uh, the first of many. Thanks very much, Ewan. Thanks for having me on. To watch another DP World Tour video, click here. And to subscribe, click here.